Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Widdett, for that introduction. All I know is I am an African boy, a village champion, that decided to obey God. And God decided to do something about my life. I am so privileged here at Gordon College to have colleagues, men and women who will put up with my accent, who will put up with my loud voice, and still love me just as I am. I'm privileged to have you. Some of you are students. Sometimes it's difficult to catch my accent in the beginning. I could see in those attentive faces. And, and yet you put up with me. In the end, I see you smiling. That is incredible. You have been good and gracious to me. And for that, I'm grateful. Thank you very much. Today, in today's convocation, we are talking about, or I suppose to address, the part of our commission that stays deep in the faith. I should remind you about a book you probably have read at Gordon College by Augustine called Confessions. In the first line of Augustine's Confession, you would find these words. Our hearts are restless till they find rest in thee, O God. Our hearts are restless till they find rest in thee. Human challenges are too often, as I observe, linked with troubled souls and restless Hearts. Hearts. In an education institution like Gordon, with talented students, phenomenal professors, the tendency is for us to tell ourselves that we may want to catch up with the Joneses and develop the brilliant minds without addressing issues of the heart and of the mind. I may remind you that it was not a Christian, but Aristotle, a philosopher, who once said, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. To be precise, in 1996, I had a privilege of hosting a student from one of our sister institutions in Indiana. I was then a regional director of Youth for Christ with my office based in Accra. The student worked with me for the entire summer. And this student by the name Jonah Smith wouldn't stop telling me how his life was before he went to this Christian liberal arts institution. He tells me about his involvement in drugs, in alcohol, and all other things that I cannot name here. And how God took hold of his heart as he found himself in that community pursuing academic excellence while the community ethos shaped his life. I will give Jonah the first training, which I call baptism by fire when I have students on preaching, and put him on puppets. Jonah will come back to the States and enroll in a doctoral program, and believe it or not, Jonah would be eventually the best man at my wedding. Now Jonah is a lawyer based in D.C., In August at Gordon College, I met two transfer students who told me about how excited they are to be in a place like Gordon, where they can freely talk about their faith. They are professors who believe, and they can take courses that enrich their faith. We cannot take what we have for granted. At Gordon College, it is our commission to deepen the faith. 
and to deepen the faith we strive to accomplish. We strive to deepen the faith, but not faith in self or faith in things, but faith in God. Faith you may not realize, perhaps because I work with the Greek text, faith is a relational term. It is not an abstract thing. Faith is trusting. Faith is dependent. To say we have faith or we strive to, de to deepen our faith is to say we strive to develop and cultivate a trusting relationship with God and exhibit its outcomes in every aspect of our lives. A deepened faith in this regard is faith that is exemplified in a life modeled after Christ, physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. My dear colleague, Marv Wilson, please take class with Marv. Marv and one other incredible colleague who just retired, freshman, you missed him, but he's going to come back to teach some courses by the person of Professor Green. They are responsible for me being at Gordon College. One of Marv's favorite uh, authors or philosophers that he will try to get you to read about is Abraham Joshua Heschel. Heschel tried to explain faith in these terms. Faith, the Jewish philosopher says, is not the clinging to a shrine, but an endless pilgrimage of the heart. Audacious longing, burning songs, daring thoughts, impulse overwhelming the heart, or sapping the mind. These are a drive towards serving him who rings our heart like a bell. It is as if he were waiting to enter our empty, perishing lives. Unquote. To strive to deepen the faith, may I remind all of us as a community, faculty, students, and administration, that we stand on two important traditions that we should not and must not take for granted. First is the tradition of A.J. Gordon, a pastor who passionately believes in developing young men and women for the service of God in the world filled with darkness and hurting people. We must and should not forget that legacy. To be precise, the words of A.J. Gordon that admonishes us to prepare the people of God for the work of God. We also stand on a second tradition, and that is Christian liberal arts. Some of you may not know that some of the institutions you know about in New England were once cultivating what we will call Christian liberal arts. Now they are not. For students like my dear friend Jonah I mentioned and the two wonderful ladies who transferred to Gordon this semester, to find an environment where they can cultivate their faith, they can deepen their faith while stretching their mind, developing their whole person to be who God has called them to be, we must and should not take our faith in God for granted, I would appeal. Christian liberal arts is distinct. And for Gordon, our mission to strive the faith is the reason some of your core courses are developed a certain way to both stretch your mind and make sure you are grounded in your standing with God. We offer distinct and valuable education not only marked by rigorous intellectual knowledge, self-awareness, all trying to Develop people who are just going to cope successfully. No. 
we strive to make Christian worldview inform and define everything we do. It is one education philosopher by the name George Knight who challenges, not admonishes. He doesn't write as if he is admonishing, but he's challenging. Knight writes in his book, Education and Philosophy, that the goal of Christian education go beyond accumulation of cognitive knowledge, self-awareness, and coping successfully with the environment. To be sure, Christian education includes those aspects of learning. But beyond that, it has more far-reaching goals of reconciling the following individuals to God and one another and in restoring the image of God in them. I would argue, friends, as someone who once, maybe more than once, said, I will never be a teacher. I grew up in a business home. I said, I will never be a pastor. Two years later, God changed that. I said, I will never be a teacher. I just want to preach and win souls for Christ. Guess what? You know the rest. I would argue that a brilliant mind cannot be productive if it is housed with insatiant heart and a troubled soul in a broken body. High IQ does not always lead to great quality of life. Let me put it this way in American English. Those who are successful in every aspect of their lives are not always A students. As a Christian community, I urge us to let us be engaged together to cultivate a community in which God is pleased to dwell and from which God becomes or Christ beams his light to shine in our broken world and in lives filled with darkness. To deepen the faith at Gordon College, I offer four areas of reflection. One, to deepen the faith at Gordon, we may continue to strive for increased understanding of God and his world. Increased understanding of God and his world. What do I mean by that? That is to see the world as God's creation and ourselves as stewards in his creation. As humans, we are responsible for cosmic management and accountable to God who offers us the privilege to take care of his creation. Whether you are studying to be a philosopher, a doctor, a preacher, an athlete, or you name it, it is an invitation to participate in God's creation and it is an invitation that God has given and God expects us to be accountable to him in how we prepare for that and how we discharge our duties later on. Increased understanding of God and his world also suggests that we allow God to enable us to embrace who we are as human, to understand that the human condition is real. We are sinners and we fall short in many ways. I know most of you in this room think your roommate is perfect. And you never had a problem with your roommate. I mean, I know this is a Christian school. It happens like that. You always have perfect roommates, right? But let your very roommate remind you about the human condition. We are not perfect. And because of that, we all stand in need of redemption, restoring our relationship with God. Friends, I do not apologize for being a serious, striving Christian. I urge you, 
If you understand the human condition, work on restoring your, restoring your relationship with God. You cannot enjoy life in God's world without being rooted in God himself. Increased understanding of God also reminds us of our value. To say that we are not, we are not just rational animals, as some philosophers used to argue. We are valuable. We are creatures of God made in his image and likeness. In God's eyes, we all have value. Disabled, able, accent, no accent, hair, no hair. <laughs> now, I say no hair and you are laughing at me. You think you should know that grass doesn't grow on a busy road. Increased understanding of God and his world, if it is our pursuit to deepen our faith in this regard, that should prompt us to refuse to accept assigned limitations and labels based on disability, based on race, based on socioeconomics or gender or class. We should refuse them because what? God made us who we are in his own image for a reason. And with him, all things are possible. At 16, I couldn't speak three or four sentences in English very well. All my higher ed education have been in English. I just told my students this morning in one of the classrooms, the middle school I went to, most of you here will not send your enemies to that school. And yet, I did not go to high school. Let me say that again. I did not go to high school. To have increased understanding of God is also to understand the potential God has deposited in you. That if only you will rise, you would work hard, you would trust him and pursue what God has put on your heart. He will show you what he is able to do. You can choose to make Garden College a place where you play computer games. You can decide to make it a place where you let some dating culture rob you of all the benefits you can attain from this institution. You can also pursue everything the school has to offer. Grow as a woman made in the image of God with incredible potential. A man made in the image of God with incredible potential. And see what God is able to do with you here and beyond. Increased understanding of God would also compel us to accept accountability. And to accept responsibility as he was. That is to say that if we are able to work towards deepening the faith as an institutional commitment, we will all realize that we are accountable to God in both what we do as individuals and in our contribution to the community. To deepen the faith at Gordon, number two, we must continue to grow in our love for one another. Sorry, we must continue to grow in our love for God. Loving God here is not an arousal of a temporary sensation. I know you like to tell me you are in love. Oh, yes, I agree. But that's not what I'm talking about. Loving God is a commitment to give of yourself in a deep and trusting relationship with God. To love God is to love his creation. Faith in God suggests that 
We are not just these people who are living in the world by mere chance, going nowhere and hoping that we will just make money and hope, even wishing that the money doesn't make us miserable. My friends, I grew up in business home. I know a few people who have money. The worst thing you, can, you should observe is to know a person who has a lot of money and live in misery. Yes. Somebody tell you money is what you need for life. Say, that strange African guy at Gordon College whose accent you barely understand reminds you that there is something more. You need to be rooted and grounded in this faith and allow God to give you peace and peace within. True love for God is comprehensive. This reminds me about a lawyer who came to Jesus to try to justify himself. And Jesus asked him about the law. And he summarizes the, world, the law very well. It's about relationship with God, relationship with people. He said, I've done all this. Jesus said, okay, now. That is great. Go and sell everything you have. That became a, a big story. That is going to be where your heart is matter. Those of you who are interested in reading the Gospel of Luke, there's an interesting text between Luke 18 and Luke 19 with two people. One in Luke 18 is about a rich young man who struggled to let his wealth go so that he can follow Jesus. The other is a successful tax collector who wanted to know Jesus and meet him. Who would voluntarily let go of his possessions so that he could follow Jesus. A deep in faith is a trusting faith. It's a trusting faith in God, not in possessions. Three, to deepen the faith at Gordon, we must continue to strive to excel in human relationships. Gordon College students, let me take a stand here to remind you what I mean by this is not, when I say we must strive to excel in human relations, I am not saying you should be falling in love all over. What I'm saying is this. In our great community, we have people who are different from us. We have people with disability. We have people with different gender. We have the people who come from backgrounds that are very different from us. As we strive to deepen our faith, we are reminded that every single individual is made in the image and likeness of God. And so in deepening our faith, we take that voluntary action and take concrete steps to try to connect with other people. One of our great strengths as an institution is trying to be cordial and begin to build relationship in a family setting. I personally don't like sometimes the attitude of some Christians who are obsessed about relationship with God and the library and their room and how their transcript look like, but care less about the people God is preparing us to serve. To excel in human relationship is to say, reach out to someone who does not look like you. You can reach out to someone like me with a strange accent. You get a benefit of learning how to catch accents. To excel in human relationship, we must make every effort to get to know people. You may want to know that people are interested in you, and they will be interested in you and what you have to say, only if they know that you are interested in them. So value and respect people as bearers of the image of God. 
If we pursue this to excel in human relationships, then we can refuse to assert false categories. Someone is disabled, and so what? Someone is struggling, and so what? They, they are persons. They are persons with incredible potential. You go to Cambridge University and meet Hawkins. And that should humble all of us to look at the people we may label and what God is able to do if they would avail themselves. To so deepen the faith at Gordon, fourthly, we must embrace and engage in transformation. To be instruments that God will use to transform and to allow ourselves to be transformed by other people. How many of you truly love the food at Lane? Great. I see a few hands. What if you tell yourself that it is an exciting venture to develop a taste for different kind of meal? You will begin to love it. I go to countries where what they serve me is what I have to eat. And if I don't eat that, I should enjoy fasting. And suddenly everything tastes so delicious. I mean, unbelievably delicious. Participate in the transformation enterprise. It is a man I know and a man you know who happens to be called D. Michael Lindsay, who wrote in one of his correspondence to faculty some time ago, he probably has forgotten, but I'm that kind of person. I read text carefully, and I save text carefully. And so he writes in one of his, his letters. At Gordon, he said, we recognize God as the source of transformation. I agree. Most evident in the atoning work of Christ and continuing in the way Christian discipleship transforms the minds, our habits, our hearts. At the same time, the Christian tradition, which has been sidelined on many college campuses, Lindsay writes, affirms the transformative power of knowledge and learning. Yes. Be prepared to be transformed through your learning experience and your encounters with people in the community. And also be part, participate in the transformation enterprise as your life impacts others. Let me just make a few closing remarks with these four areas of reflection. To the faculty, my colleagues, I would urge all of us to try to continue the good work in engaging students and beyond that, to let us be reminded that our words and our lives are perceived as Christian. So if we don't model Christ in the effort and in this obedience to our commission to deepen the faith, what being a Christian is could be misconstrued by our students. To our faculty, I would also urge you as colleagues, let us pursue Christian integrity and exercise responsible leadership. Let us seize the opportunity to embody Christian values in all we do. Let us love students by showing them that it is against Christian values to cheat, to lie. If a Christian cheats in a class, kick him out, kick her out. How many of you agree with me? We don't want to be known as a place where cheating Christians thrive. Let them know that it is a Christian value to be honest. Because as Christian educators, we have a charge to keep, to keep and a God to glorify. And to the student body, 
When we think about our commission to deepen the faith, I would urge you to remember Jonah Smith, I mentioned, whose life was going downhill, but whose privilege to be in a school like ours changed the trajectory of his life. I will urge you to remember the two transfer students, those wonderful young women I spoke to. Who compare life here and life in the community colleges they study? And realize the privilege that they have to study here so that we will not take what we have here for granted. As Christians and to your students, I encourage you to make every effort to engage people on your floor and in your class. To work hard academically. To study hard. Study is worship, as my colleague Marv will say. You should know, I used to read. I used to study what you call dictionary. What you call dictionary. I used to study the Oxford Dictionary. Study. I study from A to Z because I want to understand English and I want to be able to write well. Work hard. It is in our Bible that being lazy will make you poor, but hard work will make you rich. I love that. Work hard. As Christians, let's develop mutual accountability. Most of you are great people doing the best, but some of you are yielding to negative peer pressure. My prayer is that you understand that to deepen your faith, you must resist those negative peer pressures. For us as a community in New England, let us remember, the rest of the world is looking at us and they are looking at how Christian liberal arts and the community live. They will not praise us but they will blame us if we make mistakes. May we be encouraged to be better witnesses of Christ in every aspect of our lives so that if people ask, what is going on with these people, we can say of the truth, it is because they are Christians. I close this speech with words from Charles Wesley. Wesley, Charles Wesley was the 18th child of Samuel and Susanna Wesley, 18th. They didn't have a lot of money, but Charles Wesley worked very hard academically while also deepening his faith in God. He had scholarship because he worked hard to some great high schools and later at Oxford. He will later become a tutor at Oxford University. And he wrote several hymns. One of the hymns that clearly articulate how he understood his academic prowess and his personal pursuit constantly reminds me that I need to be faithful in what I do. And the first two stanzas of that hymn reads, a charge to keep, I have. A God to glorify. A never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. A deep in faith. Is rooted in genuine standing with God. A deep in faith is stretching. Sometimes it may include suffering. A deep in faith compels us to venture into the uncomfortable, to touch and be touched by the conditions of the weak and the vulnerable among us. A deep in faith community is not a society of pious Christians retreating from the harsh realities of life to monastic life of contemplation. A deep in faith 
energizes people to engage the world. At Gordon, we strive to help us all to deepen our faith, not so that we may lock our doors and show how much we can pray and say words for saying sake, but that's so that some of you will realize what you thought you could not do by the grace of God you are able to do. That's so that some of you will, will, will discover in your life that people will say, you may not be the smartest person, but you are a person of Christian character. A deep in faith in this community should be our pursuit, not just a written commission. And for that to happen, I urge all of you to join in making this happen. May faith inform every aspect of our lives at this great college of Gordon. Gordon College, let us go with the charge of A.J. Gordon to prepare and to participate in preparing the people of God for the work of God. May God bless you and unleash the potentials in you to excel for his glory. Thank you very much. You are dismissed. <laughs>